Hi, this is Dr. Jeff Evans from Singapore American School. Again, this is uh, part two of our four-part series on ninth grade parent boot camp. On behalf of my colleagues here in the personal academic office, we'd like to welcome you to this second session. If you remember the first session that we were together, we left off talking about moms and dads or parents getting on the same parenting page. And I left you with a question or two that I wanted you to consider. And those questions were as follows. Where do you and your spouse fall on this parenting continuum? Remember we talked about the permissive parents and the authoritarian parents and this idea to try to strike that balance ideally between uh, allowing our kids some flex in terms of style as we'll get into today, but then also having some principal issues that we may not flex on as parents in terms of what we wanna help hold our kids accountable to and for with respect to their behavior. Remember the whole idea behind rules about rules and consequences related to rules is to help move our kids towards increasing independence and responsibility. As I mentioned in the analogy in the last video series about throwing darts at a board, we're trying to be intentional. We're trying to be focused. We're trying to be principled to help our children in four years time, walk across that stage, receive that diploma, and then move into that next phase of their life, knowing that they have the skill sets to be able to do that. And, what I hope we're going to take away today from our session is some tools for you to reflect on, think about uh, as you're going forward. I want to, I want to uh, kind of put some bookends around this particular portion of the talk by saying, as you establish rules by design, those rules are going to change. As you establish consequences by design, those consequences are going to change because our kids are dynamic. They're growing, they're changing, they're moving, they're getting themselves to a place in life where hopefully, again, we're seeing that increasing independence take place. So keep in mind as we talk about four rules related to rules, my hope is that your rules actually do change in the course of time, at least those rules that are matters of style. So let's go ahead, let's get into it. Let's talk about some of these rules about rules. The first one is this, your rules should be as few as possible. I know you might be thinking, well, wait a second, wait, 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 rules as few as possible? Yeah, your rules at this point should be as few as possible. There's a couple reasons for this. The first one, every rule you make is ultimately a rule that you're going to have to enforce or at least be in a position to enforce. Not everything in life has to be a principal issue. There's a lot of things in life that actually are more style related. And I'll give you some examples of this. I remember reading a book several years ago by a psychologist by the name of... Um, Kevin Lehman. Now, Kevin Lehman has five or six kids and he's written a number of different parenting books. He tells a story one time of his uh, then teenage son sitting at the dinner table with everyone wanting to get his ear pierced. Well, oh, 15, I can do what I want. You tell me, I make my own choices. Well, dad being the kind of dad he was, didn't say a whole lot. He just sat there with his head down eating his food. And that was the end of the meal. Well, the next day dad was late from coming uh, downstairs to eat with the family. And they had a rule tradition in their family that everyone waits before they eat together. And so they called him down and here comes dad a few minutes later. And wouldn't you know it, he has this giant feather pierced earring hanging from his left ear. Didn't say a thing, just sat at the table. Kids are laughing, his teenage son isn't. And his teenage son says, what are you doing? Well, dad says, well, this is what all the cool kids are doing. I wanna be like them. Well, that son of his never did end up getting his ear pierced. But that dad used style to teach a really good lesson in life. Of course, the parents didn't want their child to have their ear pierced for whatever reason. And they didn't want to necessarily get into a huge contentious battle over it either. And so they took some tact and timing and they came up with a strategy to deal with this that was both memorable, funny, and light. As we think about our rules as parents, my encouragement to you is to be thinking about how can we do this in a way so that our kids come to understand that what we're trying to do is have them demonstrate to us they're being responsible so that we can give them additional independence. And I'll give you some examples about some of these rules or, or things that we commonly see here at school when parents come to speak with us about their kids and concerns they're noting at home. But try as far as it's possible with you to not treat everything like a principal issue. I like the way Ben Franklin says this. He says, you know what, in matters of style, go with the flow or go with the current. But in matters of principle, stand like a rock. Because there are gonna be some issues that 
you're going to need to deal with with your kids when it comes to principles where you need to stand united and you need to stand like a rock. I saw this little placard in the home and I thought it was quite interesting in terms of how one family looks at this issue uh, around food and mealtime. If you empty it, fill it. If you dirty it, clean it. If you open it, close it. If you spill it, wipe it up. If you cook it, share it. It's just kind of a message that's communicated in a light way about what it means to be part of a family, what it means to be supportive in a family. Well, these are the common issues that we see parents coming to us to talk about with their kids. And so what I wanna do is I wanna take some time to camp here. I wanna break down some of the things that we do as a school if you were to come and speak with us in terms of the order of sequence of how we would try to help you find that common ground as a couple or even as a, a single parent and then determine what it is that you're going to do by way of order of operation or the sequences. So let's talk a little bit about schooling. Of course, in the high school, the grades now matter in terms of what kids are learning, in terms of what goes on a transcript, in terms of what might potentially exist three, four years down the road. But in grades nine and 10, our focus is not on grades. In fact, I hope that's not our focus all the way through the high school. Rather, our focus is on the process of learning. What are the tools, what are the skills that our kids come into grade nine with so that they're able to access the curriculum, meet the standards, and in some cases, many cases, exceed the standards, and that results in a better grade for them. But our focus with kids isn't on the grades, but rather the process of learning. So if you were to contact us and say, I have some concerns about my child and what's happening in a particular class in the grade that they're earning, what we would encourage you to do first is to speak with your child and have your child talk with the teacher. And we're gonna be doing some coaching with the kids in some of our sessions about how do you have that conversation with the teacher. The starting point is not the grade. That is, the starting point isn't, how can I improve my grade in this class? Rather, the starting point is, help me understand why I'm missing the standard here. Or what benchmarks are you noting that I'm missing when it comes to these learning objectives for meeting the standard or exceeding the standard? You see, the shift is subtle, but it's really, really important because we're trying to take that focus off of the product and put it on the process. So what we're gonna ask is for you to have your child speak with that teacher first, arrange a meeting with them. They can send them an email. They can talk to them after class. They can come in eventually, we're gonna get there, uh, during a break or during a free, if it lines up with the teacher's free to be able to have that conversation with them. Hopefully that self-advocacy work on their part will end the need for moving any further. Typically what they'll do after they meet with them is they'll meet back with mom and dad, explain to them what's going on in terms of the process. If, however, uh, there's still some uncertainty about what's happening with the learning and parents still have concerns, the second thing we would ask is for the parent then to make contact with the teacher along with their child. And in that process, I want to encourage you to ask three really important questions of the teacher. So I hope you have a pen, and piece of paper. I'd like you to write these questions down. The first question is as follows. Is my son or daughter working to the best of their ability as defined by you, their teacher. Let me say that again. Is my son or daughter working to the best of their ability as defined by you, their teacher? If the answer is no, ask specifically what areas of concern are you noting as a teacher? What is it that they're not doing, they could be doing? Where are they um, missing the target, to use that language of a, a dartboard? You want to know and you want to have some specific concrete information that you can better apply to trying to help your child with their learning profile. And we'll talk about some strategies around that in just a second as well. But that first question again, are they working to the best of their ability as defined by the teacher? The second one, are they turning their work in on time? When we were kids growing up, quite often the homework that we did was counted as a portion or a part of our overall grade. In many of the classes, most of the classes, that's not the case. The homework is viewed as practice work. But if the kids aren't doing that practice work, when it comes to the assessments, they may flounder in those areas because they're not doing the necessary work of practicing. And that practice work is essential. And by the way, that practice work is not about earning a high mark as much as it is demonstrating organization, time management, sticking to task, and controlling their emotions when stakes get high. These are executive skills that hopefully the kids have cultivated through their middle school years, and they want to continue carrying those through into their high school years. 
So when we think about kids struggling in school, we're asking teachers working to the best of their ability, getting their work turned on time. And lastly, what's their emotional state like in class? Are they attentive? Are they off task? Do they have a difficult time focusing? Do they seem withdrawn or distracted? We want to know those things because if they're not able to regulate their emotional state or attentive state, that could certainly impact their ability to learn. So those three questions are really, really important. Now let's say hypothetically those three answers from the teacher come back all in the affirmative. Yeah, they're working to the best of their ability. Yes, they're getting their work turned in on time. Yeah, they got a great mood in class. They're attentive. They focus well. They're doing the job that I would hope they would do. And they're not earning the grade that you perhaps would like or even they perhaps would like. That's not a hill I would encourage you to die on going forward. If the teacher believes after having worked with them eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, a semester, three quarters of a year, that they're doing those three things in the affirmative and they're meeting the standard, that is they're earning a B or better, my encouragement to you is to not continue to grind away at that. Because what often happens is that turns into a friction point for parents. The frustrating thing with this, and I know firsthand as a parent of a ninth grader as well, is we see our kids' schedule. We know that there's additional time in the day where they could use it to improve their lot, study, do more. We have to pick and choose how we want to address this as parents. Our expectation at SAS is we believe students can meet the standards and that's where our focus is. So if those three questions were the in the affirmative and you were to come and see us, that's not typically something that we're going to continue dialoguing with the teacher with. We certainly will talk with your son or daughter about some of those learning strategies. How are they organizing their time? How are they managing uh, their workload? Uh, what are they doing by way of emotional regulation? Are they able to stick to task? We have some ideas, strategies, suggestions that they could use as a way of um, helping them in terms of their overall performance, but ultimately they have to come to own those in the work that they do. What are your expectations with your kids around grades? Have you spoken to them about that? I hope that the focus is on the process of learning and not the product. A lot of our kids experience a great deal of anxiety. Some of it is self-imposed, some of it is parent-imposed, some of it is cultural-imposed, and, and quite frankly, our desire for our students is that we take that emphasis off of those grades and rather shift it to that process of learning, and I would encourage you to think that way as well. But what about computers and cell phones? You know, just this morning with my senior advisor, advisory kids, I asked them to take out their iPhones, and you might want to try this with your son or daughter as well, and I said, hey, how much screen time did you have this past seven days? Because objectively, uh, it's there. It can tell you down to the minute how long you've spent on that phone in the course of the week. Well, the kids take out their phones and on average, they're spending four to five hours a day on their phones, not related to schoolwork. Well, what are they doing? Well, social media, TikTok, Snap, uh, watching YouTube videos, um, texting friends, Netflix. These are some of the common things that kids are doing with their devices. And so think about this for a minute. A kid is spending four or five hours a day on their device. Those are waking hours. Where does that time come from? Well, as the years of high school progress and things get increasingly more difficult academically, what ends up happening is kids begin to sacrifice their sleep. And when that happens over an extended period of time, it starts to spiral kids. Their anxiety goes up, their stress levels go up, and they start to perform at a lower and lower level. And here's the kicker they start to think that they're not smart when the reality is has very little to do with their intelligence and much to do with the choices that they're making. You know, oftentimes we meet with uh, juniors in our practice who are really struggling at SAS. When I say really struggling, I mean that as a relative term. They're really struggling because they're encountering their first B in high school. And it typically happens in a math related course or science related course and they start to think that somehow they don't have the competence to be able to do well. And we talk about what they're doing with their timetable and invariably they're spending four or five, six hours on that device that's not related to academic learning that could better be adjusted towards other things. Now I'm not advocating that you take away the phone or take away the computer, but rather try to help them develop some strategies to corral some of that. Do you have boundaries around their use of tech when it comes to gaming, when it comes to social media, when it comes to texting, is there a cutoff time? So in our house, for example, nine o'clock, 
if it plugs in or runs on batteries, regardless of how much work you have, regardless of your mood state, it's done. When you get home from school, typically have a couple hours to get work done. They have a supervised uh, study hall here where they can get work done. In the course of that time, we believe that they can do the things that they need to with these devices in order to get the work done. We want to try to promote a healthy bedtime, but like many of you, we're going to bed before our teenagers go to bed. At minimum, what we're trying to do is set up an environment for them that makes it uh, enticing for them to go to sleep. I hope that you have talked with your kids around your expectations related to tech, and I hope you have an understanding and awareness of what they're doing with their tech. On our next video series, we're really gonna dive into this a little bit more and talk about the psychology behind this. What are some of these apps? What are some of the concerns? And then what can parents do to try to address this and help their children? The reality is tech is here. You're using it, whether it's this medium of Zoom, uh, your kids are using it and it's not going away, but we have to figure out how do we manage this in our kids' worlds and help them be able to do that. Some kids really, really struggle with this. Um, household responsibilities. What are the chores in your home that you can help them understand that they need to be a part of, whether it's cleaning their room, washing the car, carrying in the groceries, vacuuming portions of the house, walking the dog, and the list goes on. There should be some sort of activities, I would hope, that your kids are engaged in other than, well, it's just tutoring and homework, tutoring and homework. There are other things to be teaching them in terms of household responsibilities. This is also a great time where kids can learn some of these skills from parents about how to do different things. Believe it or not, my seniors in advisory, having had them for four years, last year and this year, a lot of our focus is on traditional household responsibilities, like how do you unclog a toilet? How do you sew a button on a shirt? How do you put a tie on? How do you put gas in a car? How do you change a car tire? general maintenance sorts of things. And there's certainly other things that we're gonna be covering, but these kind of household related responsibilities are things that we can be teaching our kids in the home as well. Alcohol, in our um, final talk together, I'm gonna to be talking about this topic of alcohol and provide some data from our population of students here at SAS, as well as cover some concerns that we have around this particular drug. Alcohol is the number one drug of choice among adolescents and adults worldwide. Uh, it is a concern for us. Our kids here are unfortunately choosing to drink even though the legal drinking age is 18. But I want to try to address some of the perception issues around alcohol in terms of everyone's doing it or it's out of control. You'll see from the data that I've gathered over the past 12 years now that not everyone is doing it. But there are concerns as our kids continue to go through the high school years. What are your conversations like with your kids around this particular drug? My experience in grade nine, absolutely not. We're not doing that. But somewhere between grade nine and grade 11, there's a focus and a shift that happens around this topic and things change. I wanna to try to convince you. I wanna to try to implore you. I wanna to try to dialogue with you, uh, even though we're using this medium, to encourage you to not do that. The longer we can delay use for kids, the less likely they are to have problems with this drug. Kids who drink prior to the age of 15 are almost four times more likely to become alcoholics as adults. And that's because this drug is about coping. But I'll save that for later and, and talk more about that. So please have that conversation with your kids around those expectations. Character issues, again, this is a really big piece, folks. Much of what we have concerns for when it comes to students at SAS heading off to college or university has to do with character issues. Things like grit, guts, resilience, initiative, tenacity. Do they have the skill set to be able to handle those kinds of challenges? It's rarely a question of academic readiness. Rarely is that the issue. Rather, it's these character pieces. What is it that you're modeling to your kids around the dinner table at times as a family, one-on-one -on -one conversations, on the way to school, wherever those opportunities present where you can share with your kids the concerns that you're noting, the character pieces that you want to address. So for our family, for example, we have uh, after dinner each night, we have a family devotional time. We take eight, 10 minutes and we talk about a particular character facet that we think is important to cover, but we don't do it in a way that, um, at least I hope not, that seems drawn out and uh, dry. We try to look at what's happening in culture and society. We look at issues around faith and our practices and beliefs as a family and try to communicate those to our kids with love, care, and concern, knowing 
they too are going to have to make choices about what it is they believe and why they believe it. But we feel like we have a responsibility to help them understand why we believe what we believe and why we're trying to encourage them to think in a similar fashion. As a family, I hope you're doing that as well. Um, what about respect towards others in the home, sibling rivalry, having maids or helpers in the home? I hope that you're having those conversations with your kids, helping them realize how we should treat people who are from different cultures, societies, classes, races, et cetera. Um, this has been a big topic here at SAS this year, and I'm sure it will continue to be uh, around diversity and inclusion and equitability and, and trying to better understand what roles, what facets, culture, society, individuals play in trying to make this world a better place and see the heart of a person instead of simply the external. Uh, dating and sex. I know I skipped regulating emotions. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, this is another interesting conversation piece, and I'll share some data with you on this in just a moment to try to debunk or demystify the notion that everyone is doing it. Have you had those conversations with your kids? Because according to the data, it seems that some of them are really unclear about what parental expectations are around this in terms of what they believe. Um, regulating emotions is a huge one. As I mentioned to you earlier, that those four executive skills, organization, time management, task initiation, emotional regulation, this is a big one for kids to come to learn. Primarily, your kids are emotional thinkers. They think with their feelings. As parents, our tendency is to think with our heads. It's a bad situation when parents think with their emotions and kids naturally think with their emotions. The hope is, though, that we can help our kids understand they need to shift their thinking from head to heart rather than heart to head. Think about that for a minute. If we're going to make a connection with our kids, though, it typically happens at the heart level first. I often say to parents that the way to a kid's head is through their heart. What are we saying to our kids to help them know that we're their biggest fan, we care about them more than anything else, and we're willing to have difficult conversations around heart issues because we know that they're important in terms of cultivating character. Well, back to this topic of sex. Every few years, we uh, run a survey with kids anonymously from an organization called the Search Institute. The Search Institute is dedicated to helping communities, helping schools, helping cultures, helping families better understand uh, what are called developmental assets. These developmental assets uh, include things like family boundaries and structure, love and support from schools, a student believing that they have the ability to be able to overcome different uh, obstacles or adversities in their way. And we uh, give them a 160 question survey. And this 160 question survey asks a range of questions to cover covering these different assets. Among those questions are questions around sex. And this is one of those questions. It's against my values to have sex while I'm a teenager. You can see the data there, but it's interesting to note that roughly 25% of our kids at each grade level aren't sure. They're not sure what their values are yet. What that suggests to me is that they're thinking this through, they're processing it. Now, to be sure, they're going to get answers from uh, school. They're going to get answers from friends. They're going to get answers online. What are your answers? What are you talking with your kids about related to this topic? What have you expressed in terms of information that you're either open to them experimenting this way or not open to them experimenting and why. The reality is we're a sex saturated society and culture. Kids are being bombarded with these images, information. What are we doing as parents to speak into this? You know, if we look at question 109, it asks, have you ever had sexual intercourse? You can see the numbers at the top there. 87% of our kids have indicated they have not had sexual intercourse. Now, don't be mistaken, this doesn't mean that our kids aren't sexually active. We don't ask questions around specificity in terms of bases or how far they've gone, but the reality is we know that kids are experimenting sexually. But sometimes having this kind of information is really powerful to guide our discussions as parents to help our kids realize, no, not everyone is doing this, or, hey, I need to have these conversations with my kids to make sure that they're ready to deal with this. Because I can assure you when they head off to university in just a few short years, this is going to be something that they're going to be confronted with. And we want to make sure that um, as far as it's possible with us as parents, as I say to myself as a dad, that we are engaging in actively having this discussion. 
please do not leave this up to the school. Yes, we have a health program in grade 10 where we're gonna be covering this information. Yes, we do have talks with kids about these topics, but mom and dad, you've got to be engaged in this discussion as awkward as it is, as uncomfortable as it is. It's important for you to have this conversation. It may be in the car driving, not looking at your kids. It may be with your back turned to them. It may be you writing a letter. It may be you giving them a certain book that resonates with something that you believe is a family. You have to think of those strategies in addition to having some supports in place so that you can have that dialogue with your kids. Again, I want to encourage you to do this and not leave it up to uh, academic institutions as the sole depository of sharing out this information. Let's talk about your rules with respect to clarity. Your rules should be as clear as possible. The reason that we're trying to make rules is to help our kids move toward increasing independence. If we don't clarify what it is that we're expecting from our kids, though, that's where the conflict is often going to happen. In fact, the conflict doesn't happen when the rule is made. It happens when the rule is violated and they come back arguing about the rule itself. I didn't know that. You didn't say that. Very often when we think about these principal rules, I ask parents to write them down or have the kids uh, take, a, uh, take their phone out and text them in there so that they, everyone knows what these basic rules are. Things like be home by 11 p.m. on a Friday night or a Saturday night. Things like if it plugs in or runs on batteries, it's off at whatever hour that you decide. These, these rules, as we clearly write them out, they help kids and they help parents have the ability to be able to navigate the steps going forward. As I said to you before, these rules are going to change over time. But having some clarity around these rules is really going to be helpful to spell out what happens when we have to deal with some of these consequences. Third, your rule should be as fair as possible. Rules are not about imposing your will on your kids. Rather, it's about disciplining them in love so that they can move towards greater independence and responsibility. Just me saying this word discipline, I'm sure it's caused some of you to kind of bristle already. And it's so bad. It is so bad that in our culture and society today that the word discipline has become bastardized and turned into something that's looked in the negative light. When we discipline ourselves, what it suggests is that we're taking active control and stepping into our world. And the problem that we often run into when it comes to these rules as parents, sadly, is they become more about us controlling our kids instead of us helping our kids control themselves. So when we think about this idea of fairness, what we're doing is we're trying to look at our kids, think about who they are as a person, and plan our rules accordingly based on their personality, their profile as a, a human being, and how they're growing and developing. Anyone listening to this has more than one kid, you know there's genetic variability in your DNA. Your kids are different. Some of them will respond to the rule that you put out about time, and they'll be militant about absolutely no problem. I got the other one, could care less. You have to figure out different approaches. You know, we have this saying in education, what's fair isn't what's always equal. What's fair isn't what is always equal, or what is equal isn't sometimes in kids' eyes viewed as fair. What we have to do is help them understand that there are going to be possible changes to some of our rules or tweaking of our rules with kids, but we get to decide this as parents, not our kids, based on their emotional states. This is why it's so important to have our kids involved in this process. They need to know that what we're trying to do is help move them towards greater independence, but if they feel like we're giving them a list of things they can and can't do, void of relationship, it's ultimately only going to lead to rebellion. What we want is for our kids to come to know that what we're trying to do is champion their cause to be independent, healthy, confident kids. And in the process of doing that, we're bringing them into this discussion. Now, invariably, there are gonna be conflicts. There are gonna be things that we're not going to be able to come to terms or agreement with. Just this past weekend, my son and I and mom had a conversation around his use of tech on the weekends. As I mentioned earlier, we have a nine o'clock rule about no tech after nine. But in addition to that, we have a rule about no gaming during school nights. And on the weekends, we allow him time to be able to game and to hang out with his friends online. He would like to see that time unfettered. From the time he wakes up, which would be, if it were unfettered, on a Saturday morning around 7 a.m. to midnight or later, we're not doing that. 
but we do recognize that he needs to have some freedom. Now, the freedom he wants and the freedom we're willing to give, they don't match up. Fortunately, mom and I are on the same page when it comes to these rules around gaming time. Silas, our son, isn't, he's a good kid. He's doing the things that your kids are doing. He's advocating for himself. He's dialoguing with us, but ultimately the buck stops with us as parents. Harry Truman was the 33rd president of the United States from 1945 to 1953. As the head of the executive, this placard sat on his desk. The buck stops here. He recognized that as the head of the executive branch, ultimately all decisions that were going to be made, he was going to be held accountable for. He was going to be viewed by others in the other branches as well as the media and culture at large for being responsible for what happened under his watch in his branch. The same is true for us as parents. There are going to be areas where we're just not going to give. And in those cases, mom and dad, I want to encourage you to stand like a rock. But my hope is that everything is not a principal issue. My hope is that much of what you see with your kids is about style and helping them own their learning, their choices, their behavior, and then moving forward in life. Let's talk a little bit about consequences. The slide there says it all, folks. If you're not prepared to follow through with consequences, don't make rules. You're going to appear to your teenager to be a basket case who's a bag of wind and just emotionally easy to manipulate. The reason that we are implementing consequences is so that we can correct some sort of behavior that they may be moving down that's more dangerous for them in the future. But if we just simply throw out rules because we're in a dried out emotional state. And, and I get it. We, we often give our best in terms of energy to our work. We often give our best to other activities. And at the end of the day, we just don't have a lot in the tank and we are emotional. And if we throw out rules at an emotional level, you can expect you're gonna get emotion back from your kids in terms of them trying to not comply with those consequences. So if you're not prepared to follow through with your rules, my advice to you, I'm sorry, yeah, with the consequences, my advice to you is please, please don't make those rules because it just makes things even more problematic. So let's talk about four guidelines for formulating and enforcing consequences. The first one is this, as far as it's possible with you, the consequences should be determined before the violation. You don't want to be in a situation where a kid violates some principal rule that you hadn't discussed. And then emotionally you're being reactive because here's what happens quite often. Kids violate a rule, parents respond emotionally, and the emotional response of the parent becomes the issue instead of what the kid has done. Let me say that again. A kid violates a rule, a parent becomes emotionally reactive about what they're going to do, the kid responds to the parent emotion, and the parent emotion becomes the issue instead of what the kid did. As far as it's possible with you, think about the consequence before the violation occurs. Let me give you an example. Uh, if a plug zone runs on batteries, it's out of your room at nine o'clock or you're not on it after nine o'clock. You go into your child's room, it's 10 o'clock. For some reason you're up, you should have been sleeping an hour ago, but you walk in and there they are on their cell phone. The consequence for that is gonna be conflict initially. What are you gonna do with that? Have you had the conversation around what ifs? Like, as the rule is being formulated, what should happen if I come up to your room and see you on the phone after I told you you're not supposed to have the phone in your room or you're on your device after the time that we both agreed for you to not be on it? That is at the point where that rule should be implemented. It may be taking that phone away for a day or two. And by the way, good luck with that. It's like you just removed a spleen or a heart or a lung from your kid by taking that device. Sadly, some of these kids come and see us and they actually have two phones mom doesn't know about the other one. So if we're going to be implementing strategies around consequences, make sure your kids understand ahead of time what's going to happen to them should they choose to violate the rule. Now, some of you might be saying, look, we make rules all the time and our kids just keep violating them. Then there's two issues at work. Either your consequences aren't severe lovingly enough or there's something wrong with their conscience. And that becomes a character issue that we need to address. Sadly, and sometimes too often, Parents actually enable some of these behaviors by their own behaviors. That's why I go back to that first video and we talk about the importance of being principled as a parent, getting on the same parenting page, knowing what it is that you're going to um, 
put the stake in the ground for when it comes to some of these rules, knowing what's going to be a matter of style. Have the conversation with your kids ahead of time. Now, you can't do this for every single possible fraction that exists out there, but as a general rule, your kids should be able to give pause and say, hmm, what would my mom and dad do if I got caught drinking? Hmm, what would my mom and dad do if they caught me in the room right now with a girl? Hmm, what would my mom and dad do if I stole money from someone? Hmm, what would my mom and dad do if they found out I was cheating on a test? You see, we want them to be able to make predictions, consistency, predictability, stability. We want them to have a measure of thinking things through before they actually carry out the act. And the possibility of the consequence deters them from actually following through with what it is that they're thinking, that impulse. So as far as it's possible with you, the consequences should be determined before the violation. Third, or I'm sorry, second, uh, the consequences should be administered consistently. What we're trying to do is aim at the target. You know what? Your kids are gonna have some crappy days in the course of the next four years. Let me tell you about a few of those. They're gonna get rejected for the first time from a relationship, someone that they liked, someone that they thought they were in love with, someone that they thought it was forever is gonna rebuff them. They're gonna be disappointed because a teacher says something maybe lovingly to them, maybe even not so loving to them about something around their character or something that needed to be addressed. They're gonna get cut from a sports team or a music production. They're not gonna get the part for um, a, a piece that they tried out for. They're gonna feel like they don't have a lot of friends. They're gonna measure themselves in terms of their worth compared to others. And when all those things happen, there are going to be times where they're not going to be acting in normal ways. Mom and dad, these are the sorts of times where we need to be making allowances for some of these things. But we make the decision as parents, not them, based on their emotional state. Again, being dogmatic about it has to be 100% conformity or nothing can really be problematic with kids. That, that broaches on a form of militant. Uh, I remember meeting with a dad who was so frustrated. They'd set a curfew for their daughter for 11 p.m. or 11.30, I can't remember which, but consistently she was five to seven minutes late. And dad was just fuming. She does this to me because she's trying to show me that she can do whatever she wants. And I said, dad, how often does this happen? All the time. So I said, let me see if I understand this right. All the time on this curfew piece, she's five to seven minutes late. Five to seven minutes late. Is that a hill you want to die on? Well, if I don't do this, then she's going to expand it out, expand it out, expand. Well, maybe she will, maybe she won't. Give it a try. Try not to make this that big of an issue and see what happens. And so he did. And it didn't turn into a big issue. Now, I know in some cases it will turn into a big issue and it'll be you know, instead of 11 o'clock curfew, they start coming home at 11.30 or 11.45. Well, of course, then are, these are areas, again, where we have to go back and, and, and tighten up some of these consequences and talk about the importance of why. And even if you disagree, we still hold to this principally. But we have to be aware of what's happening in our kids' heads and hearts. There are a lot of life changes that are happening to them in the course of these four years of high school that are going to continue, by the way, through the years beyond that. Please, as far as it's possible with you, don't make everything a principal issue. But remember that it is your consistency that produces that environment of predictability. We want our kids to be able to make predictions about what mom and dad are going to say or do based on things that our kids say or do. Third, administer consequences privately. This is really important. This isn't a time to make a public display of some wrong that your child has done for everyone else in the family to see. They've done something that needs correcting. There's a character issue that's at work. There's a rule that's been violated. What we wanna to try to do is figure out how do I correct the behavior and lovingly restore relationship. That's the focus of our parenting expectations and rules. It's trying to figure out how do I help my child make a course correction because if they stay down this path that they're on, it could take them farther than they want to go and cost them more than they want to pay. The goal is to help our kids recognize that we need to make a correction here, but I want you to know that I'm doing this as a parent. I'm willing to go through this tension. I'm willing to go through these difficulties because I love and care for you. 
Now, I understand our kids aren't always going to get that. They're going to leave the house mad. They're going to walk up to their room and slam the door. We're going to go into our bedrooms and cry and rock ourselves back and forth and seek therapy and ask ourselves if we've broken our kids. All this is part of that process. But my hope is that our kids come to understand over the years that we are doing this parenting thing out of an act of love and service to our kids. We're trying to model to them as best we can. This is our first, second time through this, third time through this, fourth time through this. We're not gonna get this right, but we're trying to be as consistent and loving as we can as we're doing this. In fact, fourth and finally, what is leading us to this is love. Our consequences should be administered with love. Ultimately, what we're trying to do, correct behavior, restore relationship. I like the way John Roseby talks about the importance of love and discipline because they go hand in hand. Listen to what he has to say about this. He says, without the balancing effect of discipline, love becomes distorted and expresses itself as enabling. But without the balancing effect of love, discipline becomes distorted and expresses itself as abuse. Did you get that? Disciplined is necessary, but so is love. We need to have that balance. I like the way uh, Norman Geisler says this. He said, our love is like a river that flows between the banks of discernment and truth. As our kids move through life, they're going to need your discernment and they're going to need your truth. They're going to need to have something to bounce off of. They're going to need to have something to sharpen their um, life sword so that they know what it is that they ultimately believe and why they believe it. As I sometimes say to these kids that I have the privilege of serving, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. But in the process of standing, they often need something or someone to lean on. And that hopefully is you, mom and dad. A couple last points in this uh, second video series. These are some typical ways that teens try to get out of consequences. You know you're moving down the right track as a parent when your kids start to employ some of these tactics as a means of getting themselves out of the rules that you've established. Things like badgering, why, why, everyone else gets to do it, you're so mean, this doesn't make sense, all my other friends. It's this idea of going on like a gunner in hopes that you will cease and desist. Intimidation is another common one. It's this idea of, <laughs> I had a kid tell me that, or, you know, my parents keep this up, I'm not going to get into that school. I'm not going to try hard on that test. I'm not going to try out for that team as if doing that was somehow going to punish the parents or vicariously the parents were trying to live through their kids. Intimidation is a good tactic that kids try to use to remove themselves from the consequences. Threatening, like you don't cease and desist, something bad's going to happen to you or somebody else. Martyrdom, this is a really, really common one. I had a kid in one time who was caught cheating on a test and we're in here with her parents, and this is about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago now. We're in here with her parents talking about this, and she knew that she cheated. There was no denying that she had cheated, and yet she started crying in the middle of this session talking about what are we going to do to straighten this out, and her words were, I don't have any friends, to which lovingly her dad said to her, help me understand this, how is you choosing to cheat? have anything to do with you feeling like you don't have friends. By the way, they had a sleepover the previous weekend with some of her friends. But fortunately, uh, they didn't give in to that martyrdom and they were able to work through that issue and in fact address this idea of no friends as well as the issue of what she's doing in terms of choice behavior. But martyrdom is a good tactic. Another one's buttering up. This is a different switch altogether where kids instead, they say things like, hey mom, are you losing weight? Dad, are you working out? I love those earrings. You look so great. They shift the focus. And then as parents, we start to feel like, oh, I can't discipline my kids. They're, you know, we've got this good thing going. It's just a, it's a style thing. Just let it go to the side. But these habits and patterns can start to build. And then over time, it becomes problematic. And when it becomes problematic, this is so great. You're going to love this video because here's what we do as parents. Ready for this next slide? Watch this, watch this. This is what parents do. Did you see that? I'll go back again. Did you see that? You see, when we're not principled as parents, when we're not thinking through consistently what it is that we want to accomplish, we become reactive as well. And what I want to encourage you, what I want to encourage myself to as I'm talking uh, with you about this is to think about some of these strategies and try to incorporate them knowing full well that there are going to be areas where our kids are going to flex. But what we don't want to do is to be emotionally reactive but we don't wanna be emotionless. 
our kids need to know and see our heart. They need to hear from us that we love them. You know, I, I taught personal defense a few years ago, and one of the things I would ask my kids in that class, when was the last time your parents said they love you? Because personal defense isn't just about physically protecting yourself. It's about protecting your heart and head as well. Sadly, many of those kids didn't raise their hand. Many of those kids aren't raising their hand. What are we telling our kids? Do they not only hear those words, but do they know them by the way we actively love them, by the way we actively serve them, and by the way we lovingly discipline them? My hope is that we're going to be intentional with our kids and do this. The primary job is for our kids to come to know themselves, to grow to like themselves, and find satisfaction in being themselves. And as parents, we play a significant role in doing this. So four rules about rules, four suggestions around consequences, and I wanna leave you with this question. What do you believe are the most important principles or ideas or concepts for your teen to come to know before they graduate? If you think about grade nine, what are the things that they need to know in the course of this semester? What are the things they need to know in the course of this year? And then working back from that, start thinking about your rules and consequences all wrapped up in love. Thank you for your time today.